Hello. <laughs> Maybe as we wait, if anyone from the course wants to like say a little bit about what kind of things, topics we've been covering and give a bit of context as to how, where, where we're at. Anybody? Hey, Vaughn. Hey, Fuzzy and Anna. Good morning from Wisconsin. <laughs> nice. Yeah, where are folks calling from? A little, hang on, I've got to sort the, there we go. Somebody had their uh, microphone unmuted. Hey, Anna, nice to see you. Just inviting people to check in uh, with where, where they're calling from. And um, yeah, if anybody felt like speaking a little bit to what we've been covering in the last six weeks of the course, um, could be fun to, yeah, to just have that as a bit of context. Hey Phoebe, hey Pat. Um, we, I'm here with with my wife Tenara. Um, we are calling from from Brazil, and we were just uh, in previous days like rewatching the the whole course and what we got through, like through seeds, through regenerative agriculture, microgrids, blockchain technology, DAOs. Uh, horizontal leadership, just beautiful stuff. Everything that's definitely a tool for, for Renaissance. <laughs> Very nice to be here with you. Thanks. Thanks so much for being the brave uh, first person to speak. And welcome to, hey James and hey Jen. Do you wanna just say hi and tell us where you're calling from, James? Jen? Off to you, Jen. Hello. Hey. Hi. Where are you calling from, Jen? For, oh, sorry, Portland, Oregon, USA, West Coast. Nice. And James? Hi, Phoebe. Hello, everyone. I'm calling from London, and I am James. Hello. <laughs> nice. <laughs> All right. I think we're... Uh, yeah, we're, it's a good moment to start. So I'm just going to switch to speak. Um, and yeah, so hi, everyone, and welcome. Super excited for this uh, bonus session with the amazing Pat McCabe, who I have known for, um, I guess, the, the last four years um, since we met at Schumacher College. And, and I'll say a bit more about um, how we met when I introduced Pat properly. Um, <clears throat> just to start off by telling people who might be watching, this is a, a session that we're running as part, part of the Tools for Regenerative Renaissance course, uh, which is a six week course that we've just finished running the first uh, version of. Um, and the course, in the course we had a hundred participants join us on a six week uh, better than free uh, online course that walked them through different parts of uh, the regenerative renaissance. So that meant learning about uh, alternative uh, money systems, regenerative agriculture, thriving local economies, uh, decentralized organizing, horizontal leadership, and lastly, cooperative ownership. And then we've been super lucky to hear from uh, the thinker and writer, Charles Eisenstein, who I know is a friend of yours, Pat. Um, and now we're super lucky to be joined by Pat McCabe. Um, we're going to be running a second uh, round of the course. It's going to be seven weeks long this time. Um, and so that will be starting on the 12th of May. So not, not long, uh, about exactly a month from now um, until the 23rd of June. Um, and this time around, we're actually going to accept 500 students. So there's going to be a lot of spaces um, because unfortunately we had to limit, limit the numbers to 100 last time. I'm just gonna put the, the link in the chat for anybody who's interested uh, in joining the next round of the course. Um, so, and just for us, 
for our participants in the Zoom room today, I'm just posting the Slido link where you can start putting your questions um, that uh, for Pat. And um, as you know, you can add your questions and then you can upvote each other's questions. And that, that link to the Slido should also be in the live YouTube stream. So if you're watching, you can also add your questions and then we'll uh, move on to questions in the second half of the session. So I think without further ado, I'm going to introduce Pat, who uh, we've only met in person once, but who feels like quite a dear friend because of reading your amazing updates on Facebook and social media. And we've stayed in touch um, in the last uh, few years. Um, Pat is a Diné or Navajo mother, grandmother, activist, artist, writer, ceremonial leader and international speaker. She is a voice for global peace and her paintings are created as tools for individual earth and global healing. She draws upon the indigenous sciences of thriving life to reframe questions about sustainability and balance. And she's devoted to supporting next generations, women's nation and men's nation in being functional members of what Pat calls the hoop of life and upholding the honor of being human. Uh, from Pat's website, um, Pat, it says that your primary work at the moment has been the reconciliation between the masculine and feminine, men's nation and women's nation, remembering, recreating or creating a new and narrative for the sacred masculine and addressing the archetypal wounding that occurred in our misunderstanding and abuse of technology in prayer, ceremony and science. The other thing I just wanted to mention is um, on your website, it says, that your writings often arise as a nudge from spirit. And in this time of profound paradigm shift, part of your gift is articul articulating dream symbols and juxtaposition as a bridge and a guide toward thriving life way. So Pat, um, so grateful to have you here and um, would love to, I mean, what an introduction in itself. I'd love to hear it's No wonder I'm tired. Sorry? <laughs> I said, no wonder I'm tired. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly been doing a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to hear about whether the things in, that I just spoke through. Um, yeah. Have you, how, how is that work for you and, and where are you at with everything that you're doing? Oh, thanks Phoebe. So I'll say, uh, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you happen to be. I'm here at my mother's house. She's 97 years old and we are uh, take, looking out for each other. Been locked down buddies for this year plus. And um, so yeah, I'm, I'm in Albuquerque, New Mexico right now. And um, <clears throat> I just also want to say that uh, I, I come from the Diné Nation and so um, which as my daughter says, we are incorrectly known as Navajo, but we call ourselves Diné. And so I'll say, um, And so I'm telling you about my, my clans. We get our clans from our mothers. And um, so I want to bring, bring them forward here to be with us. And then, um, uh, also want to let you know that I was adopted into the Lakota spiritual way of life um, about 28 years ago. And that's been uh, the guiding principle um, and, and my spiritual practice uh, for, for all these years. And in that way, I was given the name uh, Wiakpa Najinwi, uh, which translates roughly to womaning, standing, shining. Um, so I just wanted to introduce myself that way also. And uh, so about all this work, goodness. Um, so uh, right now, uh, I am still very, uh, I, I've been, I had started out working in, in trying to understand why, what is the very specific and unique reason why I come to earth right now as the female of our kind. That was sort of the beginning of my inquiry. Like, what is it about that? What place am I to hold in this, in this hoop of life? And, um, and so as I began to really explore that and think about that, 
not only from modern world uh, paradigm, which is kind of how I started out in this life being, being raised um, in academics and such. And it wasn't until later in my life that I came into really um, dropping into the truth of my lineage and, uh, and, and being, and, and also, you know, understanding why I came here as indigenous woman at this time. Um, and, and so from, as I began to inquire about, you know, what is my perfect design for thriving life as the female of our kind, I began to then ask the same question for the masculine. And I have yet to move on to the, all the spectrum of the genders. Um, so I'll just fess that up right away right now, but that's where I'm at with it so far. And I would say in terms of that work right now, I'm just really, really moved and dedicated to um, bringing narrative to the sacred masculine. And, um, and then um, as far as, uh, well, we can talk a little bit more about that, but I guess what, what I'm really, um, working with right now is transforming, or as we say in this group that I'm working with, um, bringing to consciousness and transforming the unconscious agreement that money is on the planet right now. So that's a that's kind of a new <laughs> arising that I haven't even had time to, to really write about. I'm just kind of in the thick of it right now, but just to say that, that that's, that's that's kind of where I'm at with my work. And I'll just say to you, Phoebe, that um, that part of the reason that I'm, I'm always tracking you, and uh, and I am, <laughs> I always like to see what you're up to, is because I just feel like we both, we both share this way of systems thinking and systems analysis. Mm. And um, and so I feel like we, we share that in common, yeah. Oh, beautiful. Maybe we could start uh, on that, the kind of systems thinking, um, piece like could could you speak a bit about what the, how that shows up for you and your work and um yeah especially from your perspective as a Diné woman um how is systems thinking you know what we in the west call systems thinking um I, I feel a lot of that thinking has been around in indigenous ways of knowing for a very very long time um does that resonate for you or or yeah what, what are yeah. your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, I think, um, let's see, to start with, um, one thing I've been saying is I, I, actually, I actually have an enormous amount of privilege. I like almost say that like whispering, you know, but I, but I do. <laughs> and, um, and, and it's because I actually have the privilege, as I say, the, the, the gifts of moving between two very different understandings of how to be human on earth. And so I, I name one of them modern world paradigm. And then I name the other one, um, I guess, indigenous, indigenous paradigm. And, uh, well, I have to say that there has been quite a bit of disturbance and pain around navigating that before I understood what a gift it could be. Um, I, at this point, feel like, you know, the reason that I, that I talk about my culture, the reason that I talk about how we, how we hold things is not so much because I'm trying to bring everybody along with me into, into my cultures uh, necessarily. What I'm trying to point out is that um, there are different ways of being human. And there are humans who are enacting those different ways on this planet. But depending, you know, you might not have access to understanding that that is the truth. And so, you know, I, um, I feel that uh, as I go back into um, reconnecting with my, with my own uh, bloodline and my own cultures. I guess I'll, I'll just briefly say that, you know, my grandparents and my parents were both taken into Dutch Christian Reform missionary residential boarding schools in which they lived, they, you know, they were, they were separated from their families when they were young children. And, um, and so by the time I came along, uh, no one was in my immediate family was speaking our language or practicing our spiritual way or practicing our culture. 
so I kind of came out into this world, um, into modern world paradigm, you know, ready to try to achieve, <laughs> you know, to try to, you know, to for for to be well educated and hopefully leading to fame and fortune, you know. Um, but but there was something about that that was really devastating to my heart and and my soul, I'll say. Um, and so I really struggled for quite a while um, in that, and I and I feel like I kind of barely barely made it through that <laughs> that time um, until I ended up in my very first um, native ceremony, which was a purification sweat lodge ceremony. And in Lakota, we call it inipi. It's very very specific to Lakota. There's all different kinds of sweat lodges, but this one's very specific. And so when I went into that space, I I um, I discovered. Uh, like I say, uh, another way of being human. Uh, one, I my body was acknowledged in prayer. Um, I'd been raised in the church, and and my body was supposed to be like out, not involved. You know, like sit still, wear these very uncomfortable clothes, don't make any noises, don't you know, don't ignore bodily bio, biological functions. You know, <laughs> it's just like no. So it was really something to go into um, the sweat lodge and immediately get down on my knees and crawl in and be right in the dirt. Cause that was the other rule is you can't get dirty in church either. So all of a sudden I'm like, like crawling in and, and I'm on the earth and, and I'm sweating and, <laughs> and there's fire and there's stones and there's, you know, and I just, I can't, uh, something in my whole body just opened and could finally release, release, um, the anxiety and the difficulty I was experiencing. And, um, and so then from there, you know, I feel like I, I always was a spiritual, spiritually oriented being, even when I was in the church, you know, when the preacher would say, come on down, if you're feeling the spirit, if you want to, you know, to accept Jesus or, you know, however that was, you know, I was like off my seat every single time. I'm like ready to run down. I'm like, <laughs> yes, I am feeling it, you know? And the confusing thing was my dad would take his hand and he would get me at the belly and he would sit me back down on my pew and say, sit down, shh. You know, and I gotta tell you, that was like the most confusing thing for me. I'm like, but the guy just said, you know, and, and I was like, yeah, but you know, so we didn't, we didn't want to make a scene. I mean, I will say we were the always the only brown people in the whole church. So perhaps that had something to do with it. But anyways, um, so I entered into this other way of being human. And it, and it expanded, you know, as Phoebe knows, is one of my favorite things to talk about is it expanded my spectrum of ways of knowing as human being. It, you know, I've, I found that that actually singing is a profound way of coming to know. And especially if you're singing songs that are <laughs> thousands of years old. Um, dancing is a profound um, way of coming to know. And especially if you're dancing in, in unison with community. Um, and so, so I guess what I want to say about systems learning is I feel like you know, and, and, I, and I will say a, a whole spiritual world opened up to me, a spiritual world in terms of the unseen, like we might think, but also the spiritual nature of this earth and all of the beings that are surrounding us at all times. Um, they have input. They have ways of, of teaching and communicating. And so this whole earth came alive to me in just the most extraordinary way. And this is what I say usually to young people when I'm working with teenagers, as I say, if we could only really understand how much magic and how much mystery is surrounding us all the time. And yet in modern world paradigm, which is pretty much operating. So I feel like my, my spectrum of ways of knowing has come out to here, but it started out here, intellect only whatever the intellect could work out. Now we need intellect, but intellect isn't the only game in town. <laughs> intellect, I say, it's like when you have a hammer, when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And so I feel like this is a huge part of our human dilemma right now. When all you have is an intellect, everything looks like a problem to be solved and things to be categorized mm -hmm. in terms of their level of danger to you. <laughs> And, um, and so, so to, to, to be able to move beyond that, um, 
but but I was going to say that in my spiritual life, you know, what was presented to me was um, so in the Lakota spiritual way of life, there is we're, we're primarily a visioning culture. And so we say we cry, cry for a vision. And in our prayers and in, in going into that purification ceremony, we have an opportunity to engage with the more than human and even with the more than physical. And, um, and so, you know, from that place, I was told, you know, you, humanity, they said to me, you can have it any way you want it. Do you know that? You can have it any way you want it. And right now you're saying you want it like this. But remember, you can have it any way you want it. We, we have free will and we have an enormous um, ability to create. I mean, we can create anything we dream up. Look at what we're doing. <laughs> um, the question is, can we, can we do anything we dream up and still have life on the planet? So we have a natural boundary that has come into that space. But what I really, really want to present is, you know, when I think about systems, um, is what system leads us to thriving life for all? And so that's my, that's my primary inquiry. And so I'm always examining systems. Um, I'll say one more thing and then we can move on to something else. But, but I, I, I've been thinking that, you know, I come from a culture that, that has this completely different way of understanding how to be human here. But how many people in modern world have been born into modern world paradigm and don't have any way of knowing that there's an alternative really? That's the majority of human beings on the planet, I would say. Well, I don't really know, but it's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot of human beings are in that position. And so if you come here and you see the systems, you're put in schools, you're presented with um, wages and work and, and on and on, um, you know, and you just say, well, this is earth, you know, Wall Street, I guess this is earth. Um, pharmaceutical companies, I guess this is just how it is around here. Um, I really want to be a voice to say with certainty, <laughs> no, that's not the only, that's not the only way. And in fact, that is antithetical to the way of the earth. In terms of economy, the best way I can describe it is I say, the economy of the earth is fearless generosity and radical abundance. And so uh, our economy is actually the exact opposite of that. So I guess that's why I'm always comparing and contrasting systems, systems thinking, systems creation, and, and, and what kind of systems can we build you know, when I look around um, at all the rest of life going on around me, every tree, every bird, every fish, every beautiful deer, you know, what I realize is everything about the way they live their life is supporting every other form of life. It is causing every other form of life to thrive. That's incredible, right? That's amazing. And so I have to believe that we would not be here unless we also had that capacity. So this is where I feel like we're joined, Phoebe. We're looking in, and, and all the rest of us here sitting, is we're looking for like, what is, that, what is that way? So that we can also be that kind of contribution to the whole of life. Wow, what, a, what an incredible, framing and and yeah the kind of juxtaposition of two quite diff yeah different narratives on what it means to be a human being and as as you were speaking actually um what was arising in me was that actually indigenous ways of being and knowing are um built around the earth and around the human and the more than human that there it's built around beings and relationships which are at the core of systems thinking, um, but somehow, but but what you you really spelled out for me is that this kind of modern way of living is exactly based around the economy and around these myths that focus us on the material world. Actually, it's very very focused on the material. Um, 
yeah that that just I just wanted to say that that that's what was really arising in me is like well obviously it, it's interesting to me that um you know in places like Schumacher College where we met um you know there there was a course uh I think like a two-week course around indigenous ways or like ret- becoming indigenous or you know learning about indigenous ways of knowing and um I remember there was a bit of controversy around the course because you know some people were saying well a bunch of British folks can't go and learn about you know indigenous ways of knowing they should be learning about you know reconnecting to their own kind of culture and land um and then others which were, were saying well it, there's something about even learning about another culture's another indigenous cultures ways that really feels like a return to home because it's a return to earth and a return to what it means to be a human um were you going to say something Pais or you yeah I was just going to say when you first were saying you know so this paradigm is completely related uh, focused on the material world you were saying and yet not noticing how the material world is necessary to keep us alive was the irony of it all. <laughs> <laughs> the material world, as long as we can use it, um, you know, for things and products. But yeah, that's really funny, actually. Um, not funny, not it, funny. <laughs> funny, not funny. Exactly. <laughs> um, I was, I was just going to uh, focus in on. You know, when you were speaking, you you were really speaking about this intangible, like the the intangible and these ways of perceiving, which is for some people, I think, can be very difficult to like to grasp because it's quite abstract. It's like, what do you mean different ways of knowing? What do you mean different ways of perceiving? Um, and the tool, this tools for the regenerative renaissance course is obviously it's got the word tools in it. So it's about, you know, tools and technology and what are the kind of um yeah, these these things and approaches that you, we can that can lead us to a regenerative renaissance. Um, you've spoken a bit more about like the intangible, the ways of perceiving and knowing. Um, and I wanted to ask you, you know, when when I say tools for the regenerative renaissance, what what does that mean to you? You know, do you think that that the things you're talking about can also be considered as tools, um, or or you know, is it? Yeah, but since that's the name of this course, I thought maybe we could spend a moment just talking about the title and even the term regenerative renaissance does it speak to you or what comes up for you when you hear it gosh there's a lot in that title um so yes i think i think it's time for us okay so uh if i know there was some of my work that was put out and maybe some youtubes or videos i don't know exactly what the body of work of mine that was presented, but I'll go ahead and restate some of it here because I feel like it's my orienting, my two orienting things to to that part of it uh, about the tools of the, well, the spiritual <laughs> in, one, in, in one way of saying it. And so what I, what I say is that if sustainability is the highest and most sought after technology on the planet, which arguably it is at this point, who should we be talking to? We should be talking to those peoples who've known how to live in one place over an extended period of time, a thousand years, 5,000 years, 10,000 years. We have um, Anishinaabe relatives up on the Wisconsin Canadian border uh, understanding 15,000 years in that place um, in relative health, harmony and happiness. Okay, so that's sustainability friends. (laughs) To live in a place that long and not muck it up (laughs) and make it so that you have to move again. Uh, That's some pretty deep science, you know, deep, deep sustainability science. And so, so I, I, I present that as exhibit A for what I'm going to say next. So what's up with these people who live there? We call them indigenous and indigenous meaning they are of place. They are deeply, deeply of place. So how do you have that kind of a relationship with place? I'm going to say that, you know, all of these people that we that we see, that we call indigenous, that are of place in this way, they have some characteristics in common. There's no such thing as like pan, pan Native American or pan indigenous, but there are definitely some things that they have in common. 
And so, you know, I go back to my, my uh, dear mentor through his book, uh, Dr. Greg Gehete, and, and he, he said this thing in his book that, that just changed everything for me. He said, okay, so all of the early ologists who were writing about native peoples in what we now call North America or the United States, they always use these two words. They said that we were primitive and childlike. So Dr. Greg Cajete is, is an indigenous man from this part of the world in New Mexico. Um, and he's an instructor at the University of New Mexico here. But he said, so, so when he's reading these early texts of the, the accounts of their encounters with indigenous peoples here, they always use these words. We are primitive and childlike. He says, why do they use these words? And I love him because what he says is there is a system of thought going on over there such that every time they see us, these are the words that come to mind. I wonder why that is. So he said, if I, if I understood more about their culture, maybe, maybe I would understand why. And so looking over the fence, looking through his lenses, granted, you know, we're all looking through our lenses. This is what he thought he saw. He said, so most of these guys that are writing about us, they're um, English aristocratic men. And so what, what is their life like? And so as he's observing them and see, trying to look into their culture, what he thinks he sees is up until the age of five, we're allowed to sing, dance, play, pretend to your heart's content. But at the age of five, that gets cut off. And now it's time to get down to the serious business of being the educated man. And so basically from five years old to the rest of their life, you know, what, what education means, what training is, is all directed towards honing the intellect and evolving the intellect, like only. You can, you can have all these other things as hobbies, but this is the main event, right? So when these men come over and see us, what are we doing? <laughs> we're singing, we're dancing, we're seeing things they cannot see. We're having conversations with things that they don't believe you can have a conversation with. And so their only conclusion is, well, gosh, these people are, are, are primitive and childlike. Even our grown men are engaged in the activities that in their culture are relegated to children. So this is their only conclusion. So I thought, wow, that explains like 10 million things about this whole world. And what it did for me was it said, okay, so, so for, for indigenous peoples, we never stop that process. You know, I think any child of any culture, given any chance at all, what do we do? We're outside, we're, we're talking with trees, we're talking with insects, <laughs> we're, like in, we're like in it, you know? It's a whole living world that engages so much of us, you know? And later we, we call it imagination. But I'm not so sure it is only imagination at that point. Um, I think there's a little bit more going on there, but that's what intellect then reduces it down to. Oh, we were so imaginative and we were kids, it was our imagination. No, I think we were beginning to have that, that orientation to these relationships to, to the rest of this world beyond human, right? And so what I said was, wow, so, so truly, you know, the song is a way of knowing. It's a way of accessing information about the whole structure that we are in. So this is a symbol that is used in Lakota to describe this. And so maybe some of you know this. It's the medicine wheel. Some people call it. This is what I, what I refer to as the sacred hoop of life. And so I say every living being gets to have a seat on this sacred hoop, including us. We're not the whole hoop but we get to have a seat on here. And so the thing about this is, is every being has to be able to uphold their part of, their, of this hoop or the integrity of this hoop begins to fail. And so I feel like that's what we are witnessing right now. And so, so we are so interconnected, every, literally, so literally, and science is starting to catch up with this, but literally every being's well-being determines my well-being. Every plant, every animal, every stone, every, everything. So this is, this is the construct of Mother Earth. And every being has to be able to enact their perfect design for thriving life. This is my conclusion. Every being was given the ability to uphold its part of the hoop. So they were given a perfect design for thriving life. And human beings were also given a perfect design for thriving life. And so 
we, uh, the question is, do we know what that is? So uh, that's a whole discourse, but I'll come back to what we were saying. So, um, so is it, you know, when we're raised in modern world paradigm in which we are trained to use pretty much intellect alone, um, it's very hard. It's very hard. It's taboo. It's not just very hard. It is taboo <laughs> to depart from that. As soon as we start departing from that, we go into the category of woo-woo, right? And so it's very hard for us to, to begin to make this, this transition into opening up into a broad spectrum of ways of knowing. But what I hope can give us some comfort is all these peoples who have known the deepest sustainability, what did they all have in common? One of the things they all had in common was this incredibly broad spectrum of ways of knowing as human beings. And it wasn't because they look like me, they had dark hair and brown skin. It was because they were human. I believe that is a human capacity to be able to do that. So, um, so they were onto something. They were onto this idea. You know, I always say, try having a romance with intellect alone, <laughs> right? It's not gonna go anywhere. But, but, but yet we're willing to try to have a relationship with sky, with earth, with air, with fire, with everything by intellect alone. No, we're gonna to have to open up beyond that. And actually I say, I don't like the word sustainability anymore. I'm like, we need to have a mad romance with this incredible creation that we've been placed in. So tools, so yes, um, we can call them tools, but they're also an innate human capacity, an innate human capacity. And as for regenerative, um, you know, I feel like indigenous peoples who's, you know, who suffered at the hands, you know, so let's notice that that way of the English aristocratic gentleman was then carried out and, and superimposed on much of the world as the standard of, of being educated and also being in the high up in the hierarchy and things like that. So, um, you know, that, that, that's, that's happened to all of us, but it happened in a very particular way to indigenous peoples. And so we are in the process of retrieval, which actually has some very big pitfalls, <laughs> but, but we, so we are in our own process of regenerating in some ways, I'm gonna say. So I don't think we get to escape that, that part of the process. And so to me, that's what's interesting about having these conversations side by side or, or sharing information. Yeah. Um, thank you. Thank you for sharing. Every time I'm, I'm having people write to me in the chat, just saying like that they're just, there's just so much, um, there's such richness in what you're saying. Um, and, and when you speak about um, the cultures and, you know, the education system and the ways of, um, you know, you said privileged and in intellectual class uh, men, um, there's what, what's alive in me is a, is a sense of kind of, um, closing down of the senses, you know, really limiting to this very narrow place, you know, between our eyes, just really just living um, and, and being present in a very small part of what it means to be a human being. And it strikes me that, you know, we live in a time that lots of people, um, you know, in all sorts of halls of power talk about <clears throat> the need for um, solving complex problems or, you know, these wicked challenges and like these huge problems and how we need to develop new capacities uh, to be able to solve those problems. And yet, um, you know, we, we're still not bringing in um, this, this kind of liberating of the senses and of perception into solving those intractable problems because we're still trying to solve them with, with as you say, a hammer. You know, it's like if you've got a hammer, everything's a nail. Um, so there's a sense of expanded capacities and I'm sure a lot of the, the people listening, um, you know, I think there's a question of how, how can those of us who grew up in a culture 
where um, there is this shutting down of the senses, there is this limitation to just the intellect. You know, if you grow up at school having to compete to use your intellect the best, you know, everything is, your path in life is, is funneled towards this uh, narrowing down and, and, you know, even narrowing of your skills and uh, becoming more and more specialized almost, um, you know, more, more like a, a technology yourself than a full flourishing human being. And so what, what kind of practices and, and what, what can people do to reawaken what you're saying is, a, is an innate human capacity and connection to in what, is, what is sacred and, and what is alive on earth? Well, first I'm gonna give us a little more inspiration as to why, why we would wanna try. <laughs> because it's so hard to break out of the scientific box. If it's not scientific, you can't you know, measure it, weigh it and repeat it. Is it real? You know, which, which in the spirit world is like, you can't ask for um, healings that take place in ceremonies. Can you repeat that so that I can make sure that was real. It's like, no, all of that criteria is just not going to hold here. And yet, does that mean it's not real? So it's extremely hard to, to cross that divide, I'll say. So I really appreciate that this space here is, you know, a space where we can consider this because there's some spaces, no, it's just out of the question. You know, I'm, I'm like an exotic something that's talking about something that's for other human beings that you know, and I'm not, I'm not talking about humanity. I'm not talking about us. I'm not talking about you, I'm not, you know, and so I really appreciate this space because I'm not interested in being a cultural show and tell. That would not be enough reason for me to come in and, and, and all the places that I come to to speak. So first I want to say, you've got to want your life. <laughs> you've got to want your life like this. You've got to want it. You've got to want it. So as we sit here right now, can we really say that? I want my life. You know, I often say this to, to teenagers when I get a chance to speak to them and they almost always burst into tears. They're not sure. And they're just starting out. They're not sure. The other thing I say is, your joy matters. <laughs> your joy matters. Your joy is your compass. You know, from where I sit, I believe <clears throat> that, you know, you came here, I mean, amazing. I mean, I bow, you came here now. You, you know, I always picture myself somewhere out in the spirit world. And I don't know, I was thinking like out in the stars in space. And I'm like pulling on spirit's sleeve saying, put me in coach, put me in, put me in. I, I know I could do it. I got something, I got something. And then I come in and then, whew, can I remember what the heck that was? You know, and I feel like, like I'm, I'm, I'm getting into that space now where I, I feel like I'm on task. I'm living my purpose fully right now. And so what I say is that, you know, how do you know, people say, well, how I know is there's some joy involved in it. <laughs> because I believe there's nothing more joyful than living your purpose. Nothing, nothing's going to ever hit that place. <laughs> And I don't know if we're gonna find it in our bank and what our bank account says. I don't know if we're gonna find it in how many degrees we have. Those might brush up tangentially, coincidentally, but they're not the thing necessarily. I don't think that's what that's, I don't think that's what elicits this space. So I have to be able to listen in here. I have to be able to say for myself, I, all that stuff might give all those people over there joy, but the truth is it doesn't give me joy. So I have to trust that I, you know, I would not have been placed here for a joyless experience, <laughs> a joyless life in this mysterious, magical, blasting life creation. No, 
I'm going to have some joy around here. The question is, I got to, I got to root around to find it maybe because I've been, because there's so much stuff overlaid that has nothing to do with that. In fact, we're told your joy is just not even on the scale. It's negligible. Put your head down and go, go, go. No, no. So, so when I am experiencing joy, I know I'm getting close to life purpose. So I say joy is our compass. So this is why, this is why it's worth the experiment <laughs> of busting out of the box of the intellect. Uh, because intellect alone, again, try having a romance with intellect only, um, only so far it can go, right? So, so what kind of tools can we use? So one of the primary ways that human beings, and this is true in my, I don't have it right here, oddly. Um, uh, this is true in both Diné way and Lakota way. But one of the ways that we begin to make that contact with this creation and with, I'll say for those who want to go a little step further with our spiritual helpers um, is the way of the offering. And so um, there actually is a video out. I think it's under Pat McCabe first ceremony or something. And, and it goes into the great detail, but I will say that to go out in the morning, um, preferably as that holy star is coming up above the horizon and, and notice that as that holy star is coming up above the horizon, notice that you stand in that light. That light is actually a profound conversation that's taking place between that holy star and the mother earth. That conversation has been going on for billions of years. And and so I see, for me, I see the sun as a masculine entity and the earth as a feminine entity. And so I say, you know, that holy star is talking to this mother earth and whatever that holy star is saying, he, you know, he, he knows what to say because she likes it. <laughs> he knows what to say. She is liking it. She is liking it so much that life is just tumbling out of her in all directions at all times, just endlessly like we have to work so hard to to stop that we have to pave that road and pave it again in six months and again in six months because if we don't what happens here comes that life here comes her responding to that son and so we get to stand the children in the middle of that conversation that's extraordinary that is extraordinary to be a part of that and so for me, part of that offering here, this is actually tobacco in here. So in Lakota way, we offer tobacco. In um, Diné, we offer cornmeal. I know my, my friends that I was working with in, in Dart, in, in, at Dartington Hall at Schumacher College, they decided, because I said, I, I imagine what people made offerings from, from something that they used a lot as a staple that was important to them. So I don't know what that would be. So they decided it was oats for them. And so when I came back and we were making offerings, they, they were using oats and that makes sense to me. But anyway, tobacco is, is one that is used frequently in many places. And so to stand and face each of the directions to the east, to the south, to the west, to the north, above. So I'm, I'm dropping tobacco each direction down below to the earth and at the center. Acknowledging, so we say that different animals, different plants, different mountains, et cetera, depending on where you are, are lie in each of the directions. So even if I'm only only calling out to the physical world, if I don't wanna, if the spirit world is not where I wanna go or something I wanna consider, even, even that, to call in, we say that we were the last to arrive here. All this life is our elders, I just explained. They, they know what to do here. They understand interbeing and they know their place and how to do it. We do not, we're the children there. So to reach out to them and ask for input, I'm asking for understanding of how to be that being as a five finger one that causes all other life to thrive. 
That's been my prayer lately is I've been asking this mother earth, how do I be a profound liver? I want to, I want to, I want to be part of this blasting of life. So that's the starting place, you know, and most every other question anybody wants to ask me about that is I say, go and make the offering and ask. I would like to know, and we must specify, I'm, I'm, I'm asking this of all that serves life, light, and love. It's important to make that distinction. But from that place, I'm asking, what else can I know? You know, the Spirit said it to me this way. They said, your understanding of cause and effect is rudimentary. <laughs> your understanding of cause and effect is rudimentary. And I said, all right, I, I believe you. So teach me, tell me, what else is there for me to understand about cause and effect? And the very first thing they said to me was, okay, smarty pants, okay, uh, if all times are happening at the same time, what is possible? What is possible? So I've been chewing on that. I'll probably chew on that for the rest of my life, right? But they are... So, so there is other forms of cause and effect. And I know we should probably get onto questions here, but I'm gonna say this one other piece, um, which is, you know, I actually had the deep privilege and on honor of, of having some conversations one-on-one -on, -one on the phone with Joanna Macy, and we were talking about this, but this thing came up for me to say, which is, you know, because there was some film being made that was using some of her work and, um, and it was, the film was basically, um, very, very scary. You know, it's like the science says in this way, in this way, in this way, you know, we are done for, <laughs> you know, unless, you know, so it's supposed to be an inspiring film, but it's using fear to inspire right action, right? And my response to that is, well, that's been tried uh, in other ways. You know, I was certainly raised with the prospect of hell over my head. Um, and I don't know that hell's been that effective in causing right action, honestly. Um, in, in our in our cosmology, we don't we don't have that concept. Um, so so, anyways. Um, but what I was what I was thinking to say here, and what what came up in our conversation with Joanna Macy is that you know. So again, the intellect, the intellect loves to make the airtight case. That's its best favorite thing. It does it in, in arguments. It does it in regards to those people over there. This is why we got to watch out for them. So again, that categorizing thing that it does. Um, and so, you know, our science is making the airtight case for our doom, basically. And if we can only operate within that place, then I guess that's where we have to go. But I'm wondering what happens if we open beyond that place and begin to, to consider what else arises outside of that. Because if we go back to the example of the romance, you can have a really big fight with somebody and, you're, and your mind is making the airtight case about why they were wrong, why they're always wrong about this thing. Um, and what you should do, you really need to get out of this. This is stupid and they're stupid. And, you know, you know so, the, so the, the mind is like going on overdrive, making the airtight case. And this relationship is done. But then something can happen where, you know, you can, you can find each other at the dinner table again and something else moves and suddenly another vista can open up another possibility for what could happen. And also, how do I really feel about this beyond the airtight case? So I really feel like we are being called beyond that intellect because the intellect is going to make the airtight case for doom. I love that you um, presenced Joanna Macy and she's been such a huge influence um, and, and teacher in my life. And yeah, it's just really precious to hear that the two of you have been speaking. Um, she, she really inspired this work that I know you know a little bit about what I'm doing, Pat, and I, I definitely don't wanna focus on uh, my work in this 
session, but on moral imagination. And it just really speaks to what you're talking about, which is like, we need to go beyond the intellect. Um, and I started life as a scientist. Um, so I've always really appreciated and been drawn to rigor, you know, to like rigor and to doing things properly and with full um, attention and intent. But rigor doesn't is not the same as um, sort of having that it's not the same as rational. It's not like everything has to be rational and, and you know, quantitative and measurable. Um, and I think there's a way of approaching even ritual with rigor. Um, and so this is just a, an area that I'm really uh, in at, at the moment is, is how, what does that look like? What does it look like to bring rigor to uh, the sacred, to uh, the imag imagination, to intuition in ways that maybe could speak to um, folks who have grown up in, in a modern Western um, way of, of living? Did you, I saw you wanted to jump in with something or? I'm just thinking about what you're saying. Um, I'll say also that's one thing I really appreciate about you, Phoebe, is, um, is your origin in science and then the way that you're like busting out. <laughs> you're busting out of that box um, and considering other things. And, um, and I feel like, man, boy, would I love to see much, much more of the scientific community, you know, be able to consider such things. And so, I feel like that's a very, very, very important movement for humanity right now. Um, so rigor, <laughs> I'm laughing because, oh my gosh, our my ceremonial life is so rigorous. <laughs> I mean, things are done in a certain way and certain very specific plants are needed, very specific colors are needed, very specific songs are sung. So I think this is part of, um, the difficulty in this transition is that when you don't come from a culture that has, you know, generations of practice of developing and deepening, developing and deepening, using this broad spectrum of ways of knowing, um, then you have to kind of just keep feeling your way. And so it's a little bit tentative and, and there is trial and error involved as there were with our cultures. Um, and so, so I think sometimes as I'm gonna say, I guess I'll call it immature, spiritual practices can kind of be a little bit over the, all over the board, which only makes sense that they would be um, as they're trying to find their way. And as they're also not trying to uh, co-opt another culture's way. So it's, it's, a, it's a really tricky zone. But unfortunately, I think that that little bit of floundering that goes on there tends to make people want to throw it out wholesale as though it were, you know, unrigorous. But trust me, <laughs> there are cultures <laughs> that have very, very deep rigor around what they're doing and their, and their science, you know. Um, so just, just thinking about it that way. Um, and then there was something else I was going to say. Uh, Mm -mm -mm. I lost it. Anyway, we'll keep going. If it comes back to you, uh, yeah, feel free to, yeah, to speak it. Um, I'm just, I'm conscious of these beautiful questions that are coming in. Um, and I just want to give the group, maybe if you haven't yet, if you've got a burning question and you want to add it into the Slido now is the moment. Um, I'm wondering who it was who asked this question um, about the learning and exchange with all of this beautiful knowledge. Would you, if you're there, would you like to ask your question live? Yeah, it was me. Oh, hang on. Ooh. <laughs> Go ahead. Is it better? Is it better? Is it better? Is it better? No, not sure uh, why there's such an echo. Uh, maybe if I mute also, maybe if everybody mutes. Ooh, okay. Let me try once again. I think it's solved. <laughs> the echo is because me and husband are both doing the course, so it was in his computer also. Uh, but yeah, my question was like, how can we actually get to 
exchange and learn from indigenous people while the modern society is still so harmful. I mean, uh, around here in Brazil, uh, where I'm speaking from, we have uh, still like 115 people, indigenous uh, groups that are not having this contact and they are protected by law. However, uh, it is still uh, common to see in the news uh, some religious groups trying to reach those, those people to catechize them. With the corona, we had like 165 of our native people already having cases, which was bringing also for those community religious. So those things that we are seeing since the 500 years ago, they are still not passed. So how can we actually reach uh, those people that are already so harmed by the modern society, but they are still, and it's every time we are ha having an openness, it turns out on like 500 years after modern society is, is still infecting the, the native people with the viruses, which happened in the ver very first place. And I, I really don't know actually how to build a, a bridge that is going to bring people with good intentions to, to know, to learn and exchange and build a new world and how to put that uh, some way, not making that gate to also bring those people that are still with the same old menta colonizer mentality. So it's, it's really a question that I, I would like you guys to to help me to answer thank you so i'll ask you to go ahead and mute there you go um <clears throat> wow yeah that's a big question and a very uh and a, and a very relevant question here so yes this is the difficulty is that um the peoples so i say that it's so critical that we notice what's taking place with indigenous peoples. And I know in Brazil, whew, goodness sakes, um, and everywhere. <laughs> there is, it's like this war, not only between skin colors, but almost really between these ideologies, I'm gonna say, uh, it seems. Uh, and I think sometimes that's a little bit more unconscious, but, um, uh, and so I say, you know, we have to really, notice what's taking place with indigenous peoples. We have to notice when indigenous languages are lost because those are gigantic libraries of understanding of how to be human here in a way that thrives. And that's what we say we're desperately seeking and yet we're, we're not paying attention to these cultures. Now, our cultures are not here just to be a a library for everybody on the one hand, but on the other hand, they also are, you know, by default. And maybe not by default, maybe by design. You know, I, I orient myself in such a way where I say, I believe that we were supposed to do everything in our power to preserve these ways and this understanding such that at the correct time, we could bring them back out when they would be ready to be received. So. Now, as things are heating up and heating up and heating up some more and all, you know, literally and figuratively, um, there is a willingness that is coming. And believe me, there's gonna be a lot more willingness that's gonna come as things get more and more difficult. There are, I wanna acknowledge, there are many of our relatives that are already suffering and have been suffering for some time now. But I was told, you know, again, by my spirit helpers, if, um, if by the time the real calamity hits what we are calling first world nations, it's going to be late, 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 late in the game. <laughs> because so if we wait and pretend that we're, that we're not noticing what's happening to the quote non first world nations, if we're going to ignore that, which we by and large have been certainly our systems um, we're going we're in for a really nasty surprise by the time it's like right, right on your door, right in your household. So we have to and notice what's taking place. 
And I was also told though, um, and this is a little confusing in the social, from a social justice lens, um, but this is what they said. They said, you know, don't, the, the goal is not for you to feel ashamed of this place that you find yourself, which is sort of like, you've been preserved from all this calamity, earth calamity. Instead, inquire, why me? There's something that I, not why me, like, oh, I'm white and privileged or whatever, you know, it's, it's like, what is the purpose? There's a reason why it's me in this position. What is it? And what do I, I, and what can I do? So, sorry, that's sort of a little bit of a, a context for what you're saying, but, um, but from, from what you're, from what you're actually saying, uh, the question, we can't rely on waiting to make these bridges and, and relationships with indigenous peoples. I don't know if I've ever said that in my life so far, but I'm, I'm gonna say that at the moment. That work cannot wait until we can find that right indigenous person that is gonna take us by the hand and lead us up to the mountaintop. No, no. But, you know, this is why I bring up this, I mean, it's, it's, it might sound um, cute or trivial or pretty, or I don't know what, but it's no joke what I'm talking about, about making these offerings. That is a gesture that is known that human beings of every race and culture on every part of the earth know and have done for since the beginning. So if you were to engage in that and begin to, it will begin to open up your perceptions of what is needed from you. And I have to believe that Mother Earth is desperately trying to reach us that way, that all the spirit helpers are desperately trying to reach us that way, that, you know, I'm looking at Yvonne's pictures of the planets and stars there. The stars are, you know, all that is an ally to Earth is trying to get through to us. <laughs> They're like, you know, it's very Horton, here's a who. They're yelling, you know, they want to they wanna know that we, they can make contact. So, you know, there's a lot that is trying to reach us. But, but, but they, and my daughter always says, all they need is an instant, an opening. But to crack through that training we have of what is real, what constitutes, you know, rigor, all these things, um, man, that is a tough shell to crack. So, uh, but I want us to, to feel, I feel it, that there is so much that wants that to happen, that if we make some effort, it is that that opening is going to be met. Ainara, did that did that answer your question? I think sound is good. Yes, perfectly. Uh, answers. Thank you a lot, Pat, for for all. Of you, of the things you said, they actually make more, more a lot of sense, and it really touched me because on my background to be closer also to those different cultures, we can uh, not only feel but see through history more of a block than of a togetherness. But I, yeah, you went on the point. Thank you a lot. Pat. Pat, kind of following on from that and um, building on that question is a, another question here, which I think is, is somewhat connected. Um, what is the best way for people who have grown up in the modern world paradigm to respect, honor and learn from indigenous culture? And, and how can that go wrong? <laughs> Let me count the ways. Um... It's tricky. It's tricky. <laughs> it's tricky. Uh, it's tricky, and then it's not because, like anybody, you can you can sense, you know, who's 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 up for this, who's open hearted for this. You know, part of me just wants to cry at the because I, you know, I'm obviously saying, "Hey, I'm up for this conversation." I'm having this conversation like 
probably 10 times a week if I would allow it. I'm kind of cutting back right now. I'm going to take some a little bit of time off, but I'm like having this conversation with anybody and everybody who wants to have it. <laughs> it seems like not quite. I won't, I won't say quite like that, but but I but I'm open to it. And you can tell that I'm open to it, right? Um, so so you know, there's that common sense factor. Um, and then also I'm gonna say curiosity isn't enough. And just like when you know, I think we could all sense when someone's coming at us out of curiosity versus um, alliance. You know, like, I want to know, you got some skin in the game. <laughs> you got skin in the game? Okay. If you're just like curious and want another experience, mm. that's, that's very noticeable. So um, I guess that's the main thing I know to say. And I guess, you know, I always get asked about appropriation. So I'll just go ahead and go there a little bit here and say, I think it helps us to understand what, part of what's going on with appropriation. Part of it is that yes, everything has, you know, there was, we, it, was, it was attempted genocide. Like we weren't even supposed to be here anymore. And then when that wasn't completely able to be fulfilled for, you know, um, lot of spiritual reasons and other reasons, um, then everything was taken from us, even our children. I mean, our children were ripped out of our arms and taken to residential boarding schools. That's extreme. You know, as they say, actually, the extermination of indigenous peoples on this continent that I sit on right now was actually the largest Holocaust that you you know, in, in human memory, and it's not acknowledged as one. Um, so, you know, I don't have to go too far into all the injustice, but I bring it forward to say yes. And so, yeah, there are some attitudes of just like, you know, screw you, <laughs> you know? I'm not helping you. I mean, there is that factor in there, but there's more than that. So there's a lot of hurt. And that's what I think people engage with a lot around around um, around appropriation, but you know, it's kind of like, can, is there nothing that we can just claim for our own? So there, so there is that very tender place, but I'm also gonna say there's another reason that people might not be aware of. So again, translating between these two ways of being, this broad spectrum of ways of knowing being and intellect. Intellect will lead you to do things that don't make sense to people who are Primarily, you know, my elders say this is the least reliable way of knowing anything. So to translate between these two ways of being human is a big, it can be a, a, a big thing. And I feel like I spend my life trying to do that, trying to translate as best I can. And, um, and so you can go into a ceremony and think you know what you're seeing, but if you're only seeing it from intellect view, you don't actually have the whole picture. And so there are things that, that, that you should probably not be trying to engage with when you don't understand what you're in. So part of it is actually protective of you. Um, because having a little bit of experience is probably not enough and not being embedded in a community that can help hold you and can also help undo the stuff that you find yourself in that is creating harm or, or jeopardy, um, that's dangerous. So there's, a, there's also a danger factor going on there. And I just wanna say that out loud here. Thank you. Thank you for sharing with us. And um, yeah, I think, it, I think it's just a real calling in, um, I think probably, I can speak from my own experience is that sense of um, just being in in the the knowledge and acknowledgement of what has happened and not trying to pretend um, yeah pr come from a pretending place um, I think it's a it, maybe it, it can be uncomfortable um, for, for people but that yeah, thank you for, for that invitation, just to, yeah, be conscious of that tender place of, you know, what, what is, I think you, the way you put it was like, can we just have something to ourselves? Like, can we just, 
can you just like leave us to have one yeah something that's not taken away so thank you for yeah speaking to that um would anybody else in the audience like to speak um either with a question or a reflection um i'm just looking there there are also questions um but i'm just conscious of the thread of yeah if, if anything moves you to speak um perhaps somebody else would like to say something or ask a question. I have a question, I think it's good. There is no echo, right? Okay. So, um, as I'm working as a, as a psychotherapist, but though uh, my, my I was always more drawn to the something I would I would say like indigenous knowledges and more something that maybe even the 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 psychotherapist community would say it's too not scientifical. Though I see today um, like a huge movement in in past several years of like introduction of sacred medicine and like psychedelics uh, into the world of mental health. And maybe this is a bit connected to, to Ty's question, but I would, I would just like to, to hear like your opinion of this um, huge movement on, on integration. Is there like, um, even though it might be uh, coming from the people that are maybe more aware uh, towards the indigenous cultures, but can this uh, lead to another way of like grabbing and taking, trying to fit in some kind of uh, way of how we are preserving mental, dis mental disorders and mental health? Like maybe a bit far stretch question, but, but that, that's something that I'm, I'm interested in. Like, is is this um, do you see this as a movement of towards integration or or maybe something that we are again jumping and and uh, stealing without a lot of acknowledgement of, of this culture and the ways of using it? yeah thank you um I don't think I've actually weighed in on this question <laughs> before. Uh, so thank you for asking. Um, so let's see, gosh. So one, I wanna say that both of the, the indigenous practices that I'm involved with, the Diné way, which the Lakota way led me around back to the Diné way, but I'd been already been involved with the Lakota way for a number of years, um, but eventually it brought me back to my own people's way. And so I'm kind of a beginner there, but learning and meeting elders. Um, and in both of those traditions, uh, the old culture, I'll say, was not using plant medicines as far as I understand. And so there's a little bit of a, a struggle within our own cultures because eventually the peyote culture, the peyote sacrament culture came up from the South and that has become integrated into part of our different branches of our spiritual families, let's say, both in Diné and Lakota. But if we go back a ways, um, I don't know, I guess I should probably discuss that with an elder to get that really straight, but that's my understanding at this point. Um, and so, you know, for, particularly in the Lakota way, they are elders that, in the ceremonies that I'm involved in, they say, we pray with our own juices. Oh, I like that phrase. Um, and so it's interesting to me, sometimes I get uh, groups want to come and, and uh, receive indigenous teaching or whatever. And, and, and sometimes, you know, it's kind of, kind of, uh, it's a little bit crass, honestly, the questioning, because basically they want to know if they're going to get to go on this big joy ride of plant medicine. And when I tell them no, they're like, oh, okay, next, next indigenous person. 
Um, you know, so there's this kind of shopping around thing that sometimes happens, which I find very curious. But um, but anyway, so and then sometimes I'll have a group that comes and, and there's a mixed thing. Like I'm I'm a part of an organization called the Pachamama Alliance, and they take journeys down to South America and they have medicine people that they work with down there. Um, and that's all, you know, I, I have no argument with that. But but people who've been on that journey will have maybe uh, had the had the occasion to to pray with plant medicines so then when they come on the north american journey with me that's not involved and so i kind of always have to kind of watch you know where that we're getting ready to go into the inipi and the sweat lodge and they're kind of like oh yeah but there's not even going to be any plant medicine in here you know and <laughs> and then we go on this ride you know like this world opens and this you know and and that way does what you know, offers to us what it can. And it's always just profound. I mean, every time I go in, it's completely profound. And so I've just watched people be able to have an experience um, that is meaningful to what their, what their inquiries are, what they're working with in such a profound way. Even people who've done a lot of plant medicine ceremony or just done a lot of plant medicine, even without the ceremony. Um, so. I feel pretty grounded in what my elders and the Lakota people say, we pray with our own medicine. So it's, I just wanna make the case that it's possible to do a deep, deep, deep work, even without introducing plant medicines. And I say that because I, so, so there is the whole difficulty of, you know, all these plant medicines I would imagine are under duress at this point because I mean, anything, anything at all. I mean, remember when agave came around? I, all of a sudden I was like, oh my God, what's happening to all the agave plants now? Now that modern world has decided we like agave, it's low glycemic. It's like, well, there goes the agave. You know, I mean, it's, it's, we're just like, you know, it's not only with sacred things, it's just with anything. You know, now we like, uh, I don't know, anyway, you get the idea. So, um, so it's also true with the plant medicines. And so I'm just like, what is happening? I mean, there, there's big battles going on around the peyote gardens that, that traditional indigenous peoples who lived in place for thousands of years have developed a reciprocal relationship with. And then we have people coming out there just wanting to stuff big bagfuls and bring them back for, for what? You know, I'm not sure. So, so there is that ecological aspect that is very, very difficult because when we deprive these cultures that I'm gonna say are really holding the balance of humanity, that's how I feel about them, with this old understanding of deep sustainability, with this mad romance they have with life and being the closest that we know of human beings who live, their, live in a way that causes life to thrive. When we deprive them of what they need to keep doing that, that's a problem. So maybe if we see it that way, you know, it's not even just an ecological issue. It's like we're, we're, we're depriving these people of what they need to do what they do, which we, and we all need them to do it, all of us together. So, so there's that. But I'm going to go to another place with this and just say that, you know, again, I'm talking about translating these two paradigms. Maybe you're getting the, the gist. I mean, I'm sure some of you sitting here already knew it. But how difficult that can be to break open out of academic, scientific, et cetera, and, and also the capitalistic mindset. So the first thing that happens with ceremonies traveling is all of a sudden, hey, this is uh, actually a pretty good moneymaker, you know? So then that gets thrown into the mix um, and that changes the nature of it. You know, my, old, my elders in, in many, cult, many indigenous cultures, we said, you know, we didn't get paid for ceremony. And yet we took care of the medicine people, but there wasn't like this, you know, tit for tat kind of exchange thing going on. It was a relationship. It was a holistic relationship that involved the whole community that these people would be taken care of. And so I personally, because I feel like I, I want to reinsert that principle into modern world. I've been told by elders, oh, you know, those people, they just don't understand. They're never gonna understand that they have to take care of medicine people. So you have to set a price and charge money for your ceremonies. Like that's just how it's gonna have to be. And I'm just like, man, how are we ever gonna learn anything if we just turn the ceremonial um, 
place into Walmart, you know, into the marketplace. And so I say, no, I can't do it. I, I, I can't do it. I, that's a very personal decision, but I'm just letting you know, I can't do that. So I say, if I'm, if the primary activity that I'm being called to do is praying with somebody or for somebody, I can't, I can't accept money for that. I won't accept money for that. And, um, that's created some interesting situations, but, but, you know, uh, when people come to those ceremonies and we're just bringing our hearts and our spirit and we're humbling ourselves before this mother earth, all of our elders and the spirit world, that's when we get met in, in these really profound ways, I find. So that's, that's how it is for me. And so I guess the last thing I'll say is I think it's hard enough to translate between these two cultures, these two different, very radically different, like almost diametrically opposed understanding of how to be human. It's hard enough to do when we're sitting here in our, <laughs> in our own bodies and with our own juices. Then we throw that plant medicine in. Yeah, we get altered. We get to experience something other than what we know, but I don't know how much we get to bring back to really work with in our own, in our natural state, you know? So this is something that I'm, I don't know the answer to it, but it's a big question for me. I'm like, is this helping us translate between these two ways of being human? And, I, and I'm gonna say flat out, I've seen a heck of a lot of party is prayer <laughs> going on. I'm shaking my little anti finger here. You can't fool me. This is party, this is not prayer, friends. Don't, you know, like don't pretend because, because what we really need is for those medicines to really do that real work, that deep work. It's not about the joy ride. It's not about, uh, anyway, all the stuff that goes on. And festival culture is pretty rough that way. I get called to speak at, festival cult at festivals and the culture is so hard for me. Ah, it's, it's hard. There's so much confusion going on there. And I'm also gonna say, that the, the one really big one I went to, I won't name which one, uh, I saw, I could see it, that, that the music, I, I, you know, I was gonna go dancing with, I got a gig that I was supposed to do. And then afterwards I said, I wanna go dancing. I'm here, I'm at this famous festival. I gotta go get in there and dance. And so we went to go eat dinner. By the time we came back, the whole nature of the music had changed and we were going back to the big venue and I was like, man, that music has claws and teeth. Like I would be voluntarily giving myself over to, I'm not sure what this is, but I had the sense that it was asking us to voluntarily step into to taking our energy and I don't know where it was being channeled to, but I'm gonna tell you, I don't think it was for life, light and love. So watch out, watch out for those festival cultures, man. There's things going on that you don't know, I don't think, because I'm watching people just go, yeah, and also throw in a bunch of um, hallucinogenics and mind altering substance so that you're just hanging a big old vacancy sign out on yourself and jumping into a place that is clearly dark. I mean, it's dark. Anyway, probably enough said there. Thank you, Pat, um, especially the, the wagging finger of yeah, <laughs> giving us a bit of telling, telling Thank off. Thanks so much, yeah. Party up prayer. <laughs> I think we've probably got time. Uh, I, well, I just want to check in with you, Pat. You had uh, somewhere to go to, I think, in 15 minutes. Is that right? Yeah, it's about 20 minutes I can give if you're up for it. Okay, cool. Um, there's a Beautiful question here. I think it's pretty, um, could be quite a expanding question. Um, and especially because you, well, when we met at Schumacher College, you were teaching uh, a course about uh, indigenous ways of knowing and Western science. So I sort of think you're probably one of the um, like very uniquely positioned to uh, compare and, and bring together those worlds of kind of technology and science and indigenous ways of knowing. Um, so somebody has asked, what would a technological society look like? Like what, what could it look like to, to have and build and use technology if it was based in an indigenous way of knowing or an indigenous approach to life? 
Um, yeah, funny one. And maybe it, maybe the question itself is, you know, needs uh, un unpicking. <laughs> well, it does, in my opinion. Um, but thanks, that's a great question because it gives me an opportunity to say this. How do you suppose these folks were having their sustainability? They were living in a technological world. Why don't we recognize it as a technological world? That, that's, that would be what I would say. Because our, now I, when I say we and our, I'm pretty schizophrenic because I'm, I'm both modern world girl and indigenous world girl. So I'm saying our, our science, Western science, says you must leave out feeling, you must leave out intuition, you must leave out um, imagination, you must leave out beauty, or it's not actually science. And I'm going to say the proof's in the pudding. <laughs> Where has that gotten us to by doing that? by having that be de the definition of rigor. It's dissecting our holistic way as a being and saying, don't bring this full capacity to trying to understand what you're trying to understand, only bring this. And only, and even this has to be regulated in certain very specific ways, right? So that's what I that's what I say sometimes is that you know our science was not seen. Why? Because partly because it was expressed in beauty. So all of the designs you see on our clothing. Oh, well, that's pretty. No, it's not only pretty, it's like describing the theory of relativity. <laughs> It's describing constellations that the Hubble telescope is only now discovering. So we were in a technological society, you know, and this is something that I say, it's, uh, there's two examples I'll give as, as I say, um, you know, it's not that we were just not bright enough to make a nuclear weapon. I mean, now we have indigenous peoples in all fields. We have native uh, North American indigenous folks that were part of the NASA team that just sent up, you know, whatever this new thing is in space. You know, so, so we, we got the smarts. It wasn't that we weren't smart enough, that we were too primitive and childlike. It was that we had a different orientation and a different understanding of the why we're here. We had a different understanding of who we are, where we are, how it is. Those are my three things I like to say. That, that, that describes our world world. Who are we, where are we, and how is it? What's going on around here? So we had a different understanding about that. Um, and so, you know, I think about um, this beautiful writer, Martin Prechtel, maybe some of you know him, um, very brilliant man, um, but he was talking about, you know, he got called in a dream to go and be with uh, the, um, mm, all of a sudden I'm drawing a blank, Mayan, I suppose, I guess that must've been in, in, uh, in Guatemala. Um, and anyway, his point was that, you know, in that culture, in the, in, the, in the community that he was in, the idea is you have to be able to replace every single thing that you use to live your life in your lifetime. Think about that. You have to be able to replace every single thing that you take from earth, from the community, from the earth community to, in order to have your life, you have to be able to replace it in your own lifetime. So he said, so people come along and they see these people and they say, gosh, what primitive, interesting people. <laughs> They're so primitive. Look at, they use this, they use it. Well, no, they have a guiding principle that tells them I'm going to have to replace whatever I use. So yeah, I'm going to live at this, this level of quote simplicity, but really it's about renewal. I'm talking about regeneration. So one cell phone, I'm never going to be able to repay this earth, what it took for me to have this cell phone. Never. It would take me and my descendants, who knows how long. So that's, 
so 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 there can be another order of understanding that that tells us how to channel i mean this one just loves to do stuff that's what the spirit said to me you humans love to participate in cause and effect isn't that an interesting way to describe us you love to get in there and participate in cause and effect but you're doing it without acknowledging certain realities one is there are certain ways you have to be here in order not to destroy life you you are not understanding that the that a big part of that is the you have to acknowledge this was the big point they were making the sovereignty of all beings each being has to have the sovereignty to be able to enact its perfect design for thriving life so not only do you have to live your life that way but you have to live your life in such a way that you don't prevent anybody else from doing what they're here to do that's the setup i call i've been calling it the ultimate three-legged race <laughs> and here's the kicker so on the one hand the basis of life here is for every being to have the sovereignty to live their perfect design and we all have to eat each other what a setup is that not the wildest setup ever but you have to eat each other so what does that inherently mean? That inherently means that in order to honor sovereignty, we're gonna to have to be in relationship. Even if I'm not gonna take an animal life, even if I'm only gonna eat a carrot, I'm stopping that carrot's trajectory. So what do I have to do? Well, indigenous culture says, if you're gonna take something, even before you, even as you collect that seed, you need to ask permission and you need to make an offering. You need to acknowledge, I am in need of you, relative, little corn seed. I can't, I can't live without you. That's the truth. I humble myself before you. And so I'm asking permission to take you and to plant you where, where you guide me and help me understand where is the best place to plant you? Where would you like to fulfill your destiny? Oh, over here, okay, now I gotta to talk to the earth. I'm getting ready to dig a hole upon you because again, I can't live without you. I can't live without this act of doing this. Even though I'm disturbing your trajectory and your sovereignty, I still have to do this. So let me, let me acknowledge that. And now I'm gonna plant my seed. Now I'm gonna call the water. Now I'm even gonna to talk to this holy star. I'm not just here letting you go on your way. I'm putting this corn plant in your way and I'm actually uh, manipulating sunlight in a way to, for my own benefit. Let me talk to you about this. So do you see how that, that understanding brings us into a very deep relationship of honoring? So what would a technological world look like? Something like that, I think. Yeah. Wow, it's just incredibly beautiful. Um, right? It's, it's so really incredibly sad. beautiful. It's <laughs> <laughs> like I'm just like, I've got tears in my eyes, but I'm just like, yeah, what, what, what is technology in the, in the face of that? I mean, what, what are we even talking, what are we doing? <laughs> <laughs> right and so that's why people wore clothes that had corn images on them just for that joy that room there is that romance that romance of acknowledging that corn man that corn led me the right way and you should have seen all the corn we had and the, the the feast we chose to have together you should have seen that corn juice running down my kid's face i love corn I'm, i gotta wear it <laughs> That is deep relationship. Look at this corn. Isn't that incredible? It's gorgeous. Deep red. Oof. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> mm. And kind of woven into that is the kind of, I am because you are, right? I am because the corn is. I am because the the worms are and the soil is and the plants are and I am because the 
the fish is. Um, and I think one of the things that's really, you're really leaving me with is this, sen this sense of utter joy that is available in being in that relationship and how we're in living in a time of unprecedented rates of depression and anxiety and you're you're talking about the un abundant joy of loving corn do you know like it's and it's just so beautiful because it's like it's it's all there it's there for for us to to be in you know it's funny because there's that phrase it's there for the taking which is classic there for the taking <laughs> but it's there for the being right and it's not even i'm going to go a little bit further and say maybe it's it goes even deeper than there for us to be in it's us we are not separate from it there actually is no it there's only relatives and and we are actually one being it's the nature of this place i was told that there are other places in other parts of the universe that it's not like this. It's not interbeing like way, but that's how it is here. Hmm. Could, you, could you speak a bit more? What do you mean by that? When you said you were told in other places, it's- But other, like the earth, this is earth construct, this way of interbeing, this interrelatedness. Hmm. But that there are other, I don't know, I don't know if it's physical places or dimensions or, you know, where that's not necessarily the law. And I don't really know what the laws are there, but that was just presented to me, which I find interesting. It's like, this is, this is how we do it in our neighborhood. <laughs> uh, I, I guess the, the last, we probably, yeah, I think we've got like five minutes. I'm sorry, Pat, we're gonna keep you as long as we can. Cause uh, <laughs> yeah, I think it's just incredible. It's so, so rich and so uh, warming, like life-giving to hear what you're saying. Um, gosh, I mean, how, like how, I'm just thinking about kids, you know, you work with young people, you work with uh, teenagers and, you know, what, do you have any thoughts about what um, bringing up kids, how could that look um, if we were to bring them up in this way of, uh, I'm not gonna say this way of being because you know it is us, but maybe with the awareness of who, who we are in this web of relationships. Who we are, where we are, how it is. All of it, all of it. <laughs> how, what's the school that you're gonna set up for, for all our kids? <laughs> Well, oddly, I, I don't know if I've ever brought this up, but um, with you, Phoebe, but I was had a vision, I'll say, in which I was told, you know, to create Joy House, the school for unlearning. And so that's still um, on my to do list in this life. And, uh, and actually, I've, and so I, I could actually see like lots of elements of it. Um, and and so I actually also was invited into a bit of a land back scenario in which there are these people who own land at the base of one of our four sacred mountains and all the land at the base of it is, is privately owned. And so we don't really have full access to it ceremonially, but this, these, this couple has already given us some access. My daughter, Lila June Johnston, who if you don't know her, you gotta look into her work. Um, she's, wow, yeah. Next, next level, but um, she, uh, she made relations with these folks. Anyway, they decided they're not gonna be able to keep paying that mortgage. And so they wanna sell this land and they really want me and my family to have it. So, we're, so this is part of, I'm working with different wealth holders. I'm working with this group where we're transforming the unconscious agreement that money is. <laughs> and uh, and, I'm, and my, my, what I'm saying to these people that I'm talking to about this is I'm saying, the one thing I want to have happen here is I want this, whatever this transaction, one, I wanna lift it as far out of transaction as we can. And I want it to be done in a way that has never been done before. Mm. And so all these people are like super excited about trying to figure out how to do that. 
Um, and so there might be Joy House, the School for Unlearning um, on its way. In fact, there is Joy House, the School for Unlearning is on its way for one thing. <laughs> but I think to just, if you keep in mind yourself, what I'm describing here, and, 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 I, and, I, and, I, and it translated, you all got that joy of, my gosh, this is actually the most beautiful place we could ever be. In that case, to have all these relationships. I mean, what's more joyful than bringing your beloved, you know, little gifts and little signs of affections and wearing their shirt or, you know, like that's, that's really what I realize. you know, when we wear our feathers and different things, that's what it is. It's like, you know, you can't get enough. You gotta, you gotta wear your boyfriend's shirt just to smell them on you. Um, you know, so that's what we're doing. We're like wearing the feathers, we're wearing the plants, we're wearing the stones because we're like in that romance and they also tell us things. So if we can demonstrate that to our children, wherever we are, I mean, I'm out in London making offerings and uh, I'm doing all kinds of stuff. And I just kind of have to stop caring what people think. Of course, I look like I look. So they, I, I get a pass, right? It's like, well, she can't help it. You know, what else is she going to do? But I don't care. Whatever you look like, I say, go for it. Like, and, and things respond. Things. Our relatives respond. The world will change for you when you, when they start seeing, oh, wait, look at that person. They understand what's happening and look how they're acting. Oh, oh, good, goody. We have somebody who gets it and, and they start responding to us differently. Even water, mm. even trees. It's not a coincidence that that wind came up when you make that connection. Then try walking around in this world. So how about our homework for this session is to take a, an offering to um, a being, a tree, whatever, whoever, whomever calls you from the natural world. Um, I love the idea of taking oats from the UK. Um, yeah, I feel like that. That's a beautiful um, homework assignment. And big, big thank you, Pat. Really um, there are so many threads in what you've talked about that, you know, I hope, I hope we get a chance to speak again sometime soon, especially around the unconscious agreement that is money and the whole world of, uh, funding and philanthropy and money. Um, yeah. Um, anyway, there's a lot to dive into if there's ever a part two, but deep, deep gratitude and thank you. And, um, maybe we can all unmute and, and just express some gratitude. There's a lot in the chat. Um, people very truly inspired, deeply moved. Um, yeah, please join me in, in thanking Pat. Thank you. Thank you so much. Wow. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah, absolutely. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, my, my, my deep Thank honor. You. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Have a great day. All right, and you and you all as well. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Cosmic goodbye.